Spirit Sessions podcast. I'm your guide, Katie Silcox, bringing you your weekly self-love soundbite. Join us where I'll help you find your true spiritual home, where every single aspect of you is a holy ground. Hi everyone, Katie here. This podcast is intended to inspire you, educate you, and most importantly, support you on your journey towards knowing who you really are, that inner self, that inner teacher. I am not a psychologist or a medical doctor and do not offer professional health or medical advice on this podcast. If you're suffering from any kind of psychological or medical issue, Please do the right thing and seek help from your qualified health professional. You guys, what a great episode and what an honor to have one of my great yoga girlfriends on. It is Brett Larkin. She is the founder of Uplifted Yoga. She is also a badass entrepreneur. She's been featured in Forbes and Entrepreneur Magazine. She has one of the single most popular YouTube yoga channels in the world. She's killing it. And she's also a great yogic scholar and practitioner. I have rarely met anyone like Brett in that sense. And she's just such a great force of information and wisdom on the planet. And we are so excited to have her on Spirit Sessions. She has a new book out. We're going to talk all about it in this episode. Don't miss it. All right, everyone, we are here in Spirit Sessions with one of my favorite people in the yoga world. We have Brett Larkin with us today. Hello, darling. How are you? Hi, I'm so excited to chat with you as always. So happy to be here. Yes, we got to know each other a little bit over the past few years and I think recognized in one another a similar archetype of just the complete outer exterior of being really comfortable in the excitement of creation. And lately I've been realizing that, and I don't know about you, Brett, now you're kind of on the, on the downslope of your new book, which we're going to get into right now, Yoga Life. But I find it so much easier for me to be in the initiation, in the excitement, in the creativity, and even in the process. But the the afterbirth and the like feeling of the death or the nothing, the do nothing, it's so not my wheelhouse. Mm. And so hello, welcome to Spirit Sessions, but also how are you doing having just finished written Yoga Life and having had it come out? Similarly, I just had a book come out. How are you feeling? It's a huge expansion to put a book out. And it was a huge challenge for me, particularly because I like to manifest fast. I mean, if I have an idea for like a video or a blog post or a funnel, I mean, it's just insane how quickly I get things done. It's astonishing sometimes even to me, just like, wow. So the book challenged me so deeply, Katie, because I worked on it for three years and I couldn't, you know, I love co-creating with my community and, you know, making stuff based on what they're telling me they want. And I just felt like I was alone in this vacuum working on this thing for so long. And it was such a delayed gratification, which I think for someone who's addicted to that creative cycle, for me, it was really challenging to be like, no one's going to see this for three years. Mm. And so it's been really rewarding, obviously, to have it now out. And I knew that I would have this renewed excitement once I could see people reading it and highlighting it and interacting with me about it. But I think the way it forced me to grow as a business owner, as a human, as a mom, I'm still kind of like integrating all these lessons of 
you know, the book also felt like a very high stakes project for me that involved other people. I mean, I went through a traditional publisher. So there's so many other people involved in the book. And it showed me a lot of my shadows, I'm going to be honest, a lot of my kind of hidden demons. I think, you know, it's always like new level, new devil, right, that we talk about. And I feel so confident in my business. I feel like I've overcome so many things. And like the book brought everything up again. It was like feeling like that little girl, right? Of like, oh my gosh, I'm exposed. I'm going to be seen. There was something about the promotion of the book as well that was just insanely provoking for me. Even though I promote products online all the time, there was something about the book. So it's been this really beautiful journey. I can see how much it's forced me to grow as a human and a person, which is really lovely, uh, but obviously it's been challenging. So as I said before we recorded, you know, I feel like things are slowing down now. I think for a lot of people, not just us, 2024 is this theme of slowing down, introspecting more, which is very much on theme with the book. And there is this irony, right? Where in order to put out a book like this, I had to be in this rajastic state of overwork and promote a book, right? I remember talking to some of my other friends in the wellness space and they're like, yeah, what I did to write my book or promote my book was not healthy, right? Like it was the antithesis. And then a very, I mean, everyone would know this person. I, I won't say her name, but like very famous wellness influencer, like millions of followers. Like I worked also with her PR firm. They're like, oh yeah, like she had a complete nervous breakdown like at the end of her book tour because she was just promoting so much. So it's interesting, like the limits that even in the wellness industry, like often we need to go to launch these bigger projects. You know, I'm laughing because I wrote healthy, happy, sexy. And I often joke that at the end of that, I felt sad, sick and single. <laughs> and like, <laughs> and so I think Brett's book, for those of you that are new to Brett, she is like such a hidden gem, I think, for some of my community. Please check her out, Yoga Life, Habits, Poses, and Breath Work that, to Channel Joy Amidst the Chaos. And when I got this book, the advanced copy, I was like, wow. Well, my first reaction was, is this going to be another yoga book? I have hundreds of them about breath work and poses, and is this going to be any different? That was my initial reaction. And as I got into your book, I was like, oh my God, it is like, this book is really special. And in some ways, like it's a perfect book to give to anyone that is like new to yoga, but in another way, it's like the perfect book for people who've been involved in yoga for a really long time. It's both fun and practical and playful, but also reflective of the depth of your knowledge of the depth of yoga. And I think that's the impression that I had of you when we first met. And I think there can be this way that because you and I both skate that thin ice of capitalism and product promotion and being entrepreneurial and owning that, I think both of us share that in common of being, I'm super open and upfront. Like this is what we're doing in Ayurveda school. Like this is a business. We employ 20 people and, you know, we have to keep the lights on. And yet that doesn't necessarily take away from any of the, the heart and the spirit of these practices. And so I'm curious, you know, shifting gears a little bit, like how, how you've navigated, and I completely understand the like exposure factor mm -hmm. of a book. And so what was super provocative for you about it, you know, as much or little as you want to share about that. And, and have you bumped up against that societal, especially within the yoga world, sort of perception that one cannot be both deeply spiritual and successfully entrepreneurial at the same time? Mm. These are such deep questions. I First of all, I want to thank you because I feel seen the book where you talked about how it's good for a beginner, but it's also good for a teacher. Like this was this very thin line that I was trying to skate when writing it because I was like, I want this to be, I mean, talking about business, I was like, I want this to be kind of like a top of funnel product for my brand and my company, meaning that like someone who's just curious about yoga could understand and follow along and get a lot out of it. At the same time, you know, my business is certifying yoga teachers. That's my core audience. Yeah. So I was like, how can I make it valuable for both these groups of people? Like someone who's just at the start of their yoga journey and I want to meet them and pull them in and someone who has trained with me. And this would make sense as like a required reading with in our coursework. 
So thank you so much for for saying that because I do think it does somehow weave kind of that beginnerness and that playfulness and that radical approachability through the habits and all things that we can dive into a little later uh, with some really deep, deep Vedic wisdom. Mm. There's so much that's provoking about, I think for me, I have some really large social media platforms. And so I think of myself as a content creator and it's sort of like I'm in my lane and I'm putting out a ton of YouTube videos. That's my primary platform. And I'm kind of in my own little world on the internet. And then I do often collaborations with people who are like sisters who I trust, right? Like you, because our audiences are so interconnected. We share a lot of the same core teachers, but the book, I knew that I would need to get out of my comfort zone and sort of be asking people who weren't in my typical circle to cross promote with me or to look at the book or to endorse the book. I mean, that's, I remember that was a very, it's Early so stage. So uncomfortable. <laughs> so uncomfortable where you're you're literally having to ask, will you endorse me? I guess the it involving so many other people, whether people I needed to blurb and get to quote the book, of which I got some really amazing people, you know, James Nestor, you, Elena Brower, like some incredible people. But doing those asks was extremely uncomfortable. And it's it's actually really interesting if we dive into polarity and like energetic work here, because I think people like you and me who are entrepreneurs, and it's like, we're building our little slice of content and business on the internet. It's like, we want to be self-sufficient. And all of a sudden when you're writing a book and then you need a lot of other people to endorse you and help you and be involved, it's like, you need to not just ask, but be willing to receive. It's if you're very type A or more towards the masculine pole, right? Like that's do it yourself. (laughs) Like that's very uncomfortable. I'm like, I would rather just do it all myself. Like I'd rather like pull six all nighters and just like accomplish this alone. But for for me, for the book, like that, I wasn't allowed to do that anymore. Like there was no other way. I I wasn't going to get people to endorse. Like there was no way to get an endorsement for the book, like by myself. So I think that, like, you know, those patterns, right. Of like, I don't need anyone's help. I can do it all by myself. It forced me to shatter those. Hmm. I think that was a lot of the discomfort and growth and something I'm stepping into more is just like, I I can be in co-creation and collaboration with other people. I can lean on my friends like you and other people on the industry who actually want to help. I mean, my husband was so helpful to me because he just kept telling me, he was like, People love to be helpful. People want to help you. He was like, people love quick wins, right? If you make it easy for them, kind of template what you have in mind for them to say, like people love helping other people. And he, I was so grateful for the way he kind of walked me through my panic and talked me through this because it was very helpful for me to reframe my perspective because the place I went was being that little girl who's so vulnerable and so afraid, who needs to ask for this big, scary thing and feeling afraid prematurely of the sting of any potential rejection and what that might mean about me. Right. That's really it. Right. And so it's like these two sides of the same Shakti, the power of being validated and uplifted and endorsed. I mean, look at that word. And Mm -hmm. then that Shakti sits right beside her is the other Shakti, which is the great power of rejection of being reject the rejected one. I remember teaching a yoga teacher training in Mexico when I was really young. And I used to take these groups of women down to this villa in Mexico. It was absolutely insane and and really fun and amazing. But we would do these month-long trainings. And I remember the girls, you know, they were all young, were very critical of us as teachers. And I remember one day, because we're all sort of the same age, just kind of figuring out life, you know. And I remember sitting up and saying, do you guys know how vulnerable the teacher is? Do you understand how much courage it takes to get up in front of you all and just speak and not have a PR perfected, ready-made speech, but to speak from the heart that human beings statistically are more afraid of public speaking than dying. So Mm -hmm. there's that Jerry Seinfeld joke, like we would rather be in the coffin than do the eulogy. Like that's how powerful 
the rejection feeling is and in that hit like and you know when i say they were being critical i was i mean they were not understanding that because they hadn't sat in that place of being in front of the room and then when they had to teach their first class the very same people that were the first to sort of give their critical opinion were having these like meltdowns and crying and and it was like a beautiful experience because they were like oh my god this is really hard i can't believe and it's not like oh you know us teachers who are at the front of the room give us all your sympathy it's not like that it's just really opening up to the inner experience of the rejected one and the and the applauded one and i think that's what writing a book now twice for me has really enabled me to do you know I wrote one of my mentors that I considered to be just like one of my favorite teachers and asked for an endorsement and the answer was no and to sit in that and to be able to go into that shadow work of where is it that it stings so much and to really just sit with that and feel that rejection and to then be able to come out the other side saying, I love myself and I've got myself. And it was actually like, it still stings a little bit. I'm not going to lie. But like, that was like, that was like better than her endorsement. Yeah, it was interesting for me too. the the surprises, right? There's people yeah. who are, I was like, oh, this person will be in my corner. This is the shoe in like, we're so close. And, yeah. and you get a no, or it doesn't work. And then, but at the same time, you know, some really beautiful surprises of people who I did not expect in my wildest dreams would want to support me and endorse me, which woo, the charge of that word. Right. Yeah. So I think it's fascinating. And, and this is where, I mean, I think what we're circling on is how all of life no matter what you're doing, whether you're parenting or you're in relationship or you're running a business or promoting a book. I mean, I hope what listeners are seeing, it's like all of this is a spiritual practice. And that's why I call the book Yoga Life. The book is about how to bring yoga into your daily life, not yoga being this additional thing to do that we check off a list. Mm. How do we use I think of yoga really as the science of energy management and the ability to have a lot of self-awareness. And so it's like when I'm interweaving those things throughout my whole day, it's like my whole life is a yoga studio. And that's something I wanted to call the book originally. I think that might've been the proposal name actually, yeah, I, like I, I, your was, life is a yoga studio or something and it got shortened. That was one of the things I, I wanted to bring up that your life is a yoga studio is one of your chapters. And I was like, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, I mean, for those who are listening, some people, I get the feeling that most of my audience has done some yoga, but what I love about this book is that a, it's super compassionate and meets people where they are. And also it leans into one of these central premises from the lineage that you and I both studied in, which is that a, it's about energy and B, it's super personal. So walk us through some of the ways in the book that people can expect to be able to personalize a yoga practice. And why would they want to do that? Mm. Well, in the research for this book, what I uncovered is that yoga was always meant to be personalized. So we've been fed, I don't want to say watered down, but we've been fed, let's just call it like a slightly distorted version of yoga. Mm. When yoga came West in the seventies and eighties, it got enmeshed with the group fitness movement that was popular during the time, like Jane Fonda. And then the poses were extremely overemphasized. So this is how we ended up with these studio classes where everyone's expected to do the same pose with the same breath cadence at the same pace in the same way. And when we start to really pick that apart, it's absurd. And I'll explain why, but now I'm definitely not saying don't go to studio classes or retreats because there's so much value in being in community and connecting with others in that way. But I felt like there were a lot of books about these different like asana styles or methodologies already. So I wanted to create something really different. So the book starts with actually an Ayurvedic quiz, which you would appreciate. Probably a lot of people in your audience would appreciate. It takes a very high level view on Ayurveda. 
But the idea is that we can use the knowledge of your Ayurvedic constitution to really highly personalize your practice. It's fascinating to me because I get these ads on Facebook. I don't know if you get them, Katie, for like the personalized shampoo people. It's like rose or something. Personalized nutrition is skyrocketing in popularity. We kind of know that personalization is the future. We know that medication affects everyone differently, right? That's common knowledge. That's why there's this list of huge side effects. We know that only 10% of our gut microbiome is the same between you and me. So when we start adding all of this up, it's like, how could it possibly make sense that like the same pranayama techniques or the same asana poses would make sense for various different groups of people? Like that thought is absurd. And when we look back, you know, the way yoga was taught when it kind of came into the Akara, it was called at the time, the closest, like the pre-prototypical yoga studio is that people were practicing together, but they were all doing different things. Mm. And the teacher wasn't teaching and instructing in front of the room loudly with a microphone, or he was going individually to different people and saying, hey, I think you're ready to progress. And here are some new poses you can add on to what you're doing. Or he was saying to someone, hey, try this instead of this. It was very much the Mysore approach where we came together to practice near each other, but it wasn't like a group synchronized experience in any way, shape, or form. You learn directly from one teacher who added on more poses when someone was ready. Compare and contrast that to today where everyone's expected to do the same thing, which first of all is absurd because our skeletal structures are so different. So there's a chapter on that. I mean, I know there's many well-intentioned yoga teachers who are like, just keep practicing, just keep trying, you know, eventually you'll touch your toes or your knees will touch the ground. And I say very clearly in the book, like, actually you won't <laughs> like depending on your hip structure that just may never happen certain poses never may be available to you luckily that's not the point so the book opens with kind of this quiz because i think ayurveda is such a great frame like if i know if i'm fire earth or air dominant that can right away help me make a ton of beneficial choices to help balance me, right? Everyone here listening knows Ayurveda is the science of opposites, right? So if you have high air and fire, you're going to need more earth. If you have high earth, you're going to probably need more air and fire. The irony in all of this is that we tend to be attracted to the yoga poses and styles that exacerbate our less desired traits and tendencies. Meaning like if you have high air, you're likely attracted to Kundalini yoga, which cultivates more air. If you have high fire like me, you're probably initially attracted to, I was Bikram yoga, something hot, heating, intense, because it feels familiar, like attracts like, but we need to take a more sophisticated view onto our practice. And so from there, we assemble a 20 minute personal ritual for you in the book that has these different segments. And then at the end of the book, we tear it all apart. I'm like, okay, here's how you'd only do uh, five minutes. Here's how you do 10 minutes. Like if you don't have 20, right? If your baby didn't sleep well, just do this. If you have high fire and you need to give a presentation in a couple minutes, you actually do need some energy, but you woke up late. Like here's how you'd modify your ritual. So we kind of create this template, but then I show you how to mix, match, tear it all apart. Oh, like everything's amazing. Your house is clean. You know, your kids are away. Like, here's how you'd expand this 20 minute thing to 60 or 90 minutes. But the overall reframe here is that the practice should adapt to meet you. The practice should feel nourishing for you. You shouldn't be shoehorning yourself into poses. And so many people ask me about how do I get consistent with my yoga practice? Well, the answer is that you make it so nourishing that you'd never want to skip it. So basically the book's giving you the tools to be this apothecarian, right? I know it's weird to do like a bartender analogy, but we will because I know you used to bartend. But like, you know, the bartender knows how to whip up a cocktail or a tincture for the person in front of them. And that's what I want everyone to be able to know how to do. And what's interesting is even some of the most advanced teachers I trained, they didn't have this skill, right? They didn't have this skill of like, okay, I feel depressed or depleted right? I know I'm high Vata. I only have 10 minutes to practice. Like they wouldn't know what to whip up for themselves in that very short amount of time that would be potent and effective. And I could go on about how the personalized well, no, practice is I, the most potent practice, but let's pause right. for a moment here. Well, I was just going to say, this is so great. And I think so helpful, by the way, I don't teach asana anymore. And Brett is the official sister school 
for the asana for Ayurveda school because you get it and you understand not only the Ayurveda of yoga asana, but more importantly, you understand the heart and the soul of tantra, of yoga, that was energy. And I think the bigger sort of subtext to everything you're saying is, I think of that question in the Bhagavad Gita, like the great question we're always being asked is what do I do next? And you also mentioned the word addiction in the beginning, and it can also turn into an addiction. We have an addiction to our sequence or our yoga practice. And this book really helps people break the addiction and understand that your yoga will be different when you're 25 than when you're 55. And I'm seeing that for myself. And so I think there's just so much value in understanding the humility that it actually requires to be a yogi. I remember studying with A.G. Mohan, who was Krishnamacharya's great student, who decided to start teaching yoga in his 60s. And I lived in their house and did yoga with Indra and, and AG. And it was just like the simplest yoga and breath work. And I remember him telling us stories about Krishnamacharya. And I'm just reifying your point, which is Krishnamacharya would stand in the room, you know, according to AG and do exactly what you just said. It wasn't, it was like this very one-on-one -on -one deep teacher student relationship. And if we, even go beyond, and I want to get into some things that you do get into in the book, but if we go beyond even the, the poses, what he was attempting to do with his student was to see the unseen. The guru, the remover of the darkness, wasn't like some creepy guy telling you how to live your life and be your everything. It was the one who was able to see that in you, which you weren't able to see and bring that to light, whether that be physical, energetic, but most importantly, spiritual. And so to be able to understand as AG helped me do, this is a pathway to God, or if you want to call it the divine, that's fine. But like yoga is a path to expansion of consciousness. And what in the moment is in the service of the expansion of the consciousness, whether it be shifting the biophysiology through eating differently in Ayurveda or through doing a forward bend sequence because it helps activate the parasympathetic nervous system. I mean, on and on and on. But the bigger question is how can I arrange the physiology, the emotions, the energy, and the psyche so as to be more able to receive the awareness that I am divinity and everything else is. And so I wanted to talk about just the deep scholarship, Brett, that you hold and some of the origins of yoga, I think might be really helpful for people to understand. You mentioned the arrangement in the West of these quote, you know, sacred poses into the model of a uh, aerobics class. And, you know, I did a podcast years and years ago. It sort of went mini viral around, we have a misunderstanding of these poses themselves. That was so liberating for me because as I, as I began to research the history, I found that there wasn't actually much going on in India with a lot of the things we would consider yoga now. I mean, of course, we can go back to the Pashpupati seals and see these meditative breathwork techniques on the cave, the etchings in the caves from thousands and thousands of years ago. But moreover, what we find is this cultural, so good ideas like to travel and good ideas like to intermingle. And so you see Northern European gymnastics mixing with British army technology, going down into India through colonialism, mixing with the Indian pranayama and energy work. And lo and behold, you have this thing called yoga. And I mean, we can talk a lot about like Krishnamacharya studying with the Tibetans and learning these energy work. So I guess all this to say, guys, you really need to read this book because she talks about 
that mix. So I'm wondering if we could just, yeah, here we go. Yeah. There's some great illustrations in here. I do think we, you know, there's so many, uh, pieces of this practice that we do want to respect and not change. However, when I look at the history of the asana, just like you're saying, all it's done is change. All it's, done is change. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a melding pot and there's footnotes to back all of this up. And again, we have it direct from Katie as well, who <laughs> knew people who knew Krishna Macharya. So, you know, to paint a picture here, obviously there's a whole chapter about the evolution of modern yoga in the book, but to highlight some key things, many of which maybe a review for some listeners, but yoga was designed the you know, ancient, ancient yoga. It was designed for two groups of people that we have documented, right? I always say that we have documented because who knows what women and other people were doing. They just perhaps yeah. did not women, women document didn't it. A lot of, women didn't get a lot of publishers back in those yeah, days. Exactly. Or like time to like do cave etchings, right? They were probably like nursing and breastfeeding and so I always like to say that we have documented. So the yoga we have documented is designed, or if we look at something like the yoga sutras, it's designed for two groups of people, young men who were entering the equivalent of a monastic life, meaning that they were going to do nothing but perform religious rites and rituals, focus on yogic, spiritual practices all day, every day while living in an ashram, essentially type lifestyle. And elderly, elderly men who once they were done being a grandfather in their village would go off and wander in the woods that give up all their material possessions in order to prepare for the next life. So it was very much, I'm going to prepare for my soul to leave my physical body, right? Because they believed in reincarnation. So they were doing yogic practices to prepare for that. And that's where we get kind of that image of the yogi in a cave. So Another chapter I have in the book talks about like, well, what about the householder yogi, right? Like, what about the people like you and me and probably everyone listening to this podcast, you know, where do we fit in? And I'm so, I, I don't know if, I think we probably share this view, Katie, but I'm like, the Gita is a much better resource for you than the sutras if you are a householder. Uh, but for whatever reason, the yoga sutras are the, the text that's very popularized in the West, even though it's only one of so many fantastic, I mean, I love it, but it's just one of so many fantastic texts and we have so many great tantric texts. Anyway, so what what's really interesting is that the yoga that was documented up to this point that we see was all about leaving the physical body. The body was actually seen as an enemy. Like the body was an obstacle to overcome. The body has all these pesky urges. It wants food. It wants sex. It wants to twitch. It wants to move. So what these young men and these grandfathers were doing was like, how do I disassociate from my body so I can prepare for, you know, deep communion with God through leaving my physical form, disassociating with my physical form or prepare for the next life. And this is where we see these depictions of yogis starving themselves, right? Or being in freezing temperatures for long periods of time. So one man really changed all of this and repositioned yoga forever. And he basically said, it's just crazy. Cause when I, I look at the timeline, Krishnamacharya, I mean, talk about an innovator. He took all this around. He evolved yoga in such a powerful way that he actually said, you know what? Yoga is not about escaping the body. Yoga is good for the body. It's actually something we do for, to be healthy. In this repositioning, he made yoga something that instead of just being for these select few people, something that was available to everyone. In order to do this, yoga is good for the body. Guess what? He had to really emphasize the physical postures. And in the industrial revolution, so if we look what was happening in the world at this time, people were migrating to cities. So throughout Europe and everywhere, like people got indoor plumbing, uh, many people were working in factories, like people's quality of life really improved, but they weren't toiling away in fields so much anymore. Like if we take a big, broad picture view. So what's interesting is as people got electricity and toilets and all these things, like they had time, they had bandwidth to be like, how do we focus on our physical health? especially if I'm maybe working at a desk now, right? Like this is again, all at the turn of the century, like late 1800s. Uh, so this interest in physical fitness emerged that we, we hadn't seen prior to that because before that, like we were surviving. <laughs> yeah, like so, if you're in the field, the last thing you're yeah. doing about is getting a workout. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So we see all sorts of innovators in this space. 
Adonia Wallace is one who I highlight in the UK. One of my other favorites who, you know, he's doing all of Iyengar's postures in the US before Iyengar ever came here is Thomas Dwight. And gymnastics was really taking off in Sweden and, and different parts of Europe. And so Krishnamacharya, when he repositioned and kind of modernized yoga to make it for everyone, he started blending the asana that we maybe have from the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, which is not that many poses. Like we're talking like a dozen, 20. I think they're uh, all seated. Though. Yeah. And a lot of them are seated. And he started blending Indian martial arts, which was hugely popular at the time. Because again, he wanted to get young people interested, right? You know, that's where we get Chaturanga. He started blending the gymnastics uh, that was sweeping Europe, this interest in physical fitness. And then his three pupils, Iyengar, Joyce, and Desikachar, they're the ones who then eventually brought Yoga West and each of their lineages kind of evolved a little bit differently to give us kind of the yoga that we've been fed today. So, I mean, is that kind of a little bit the background that you were looking for? Well, I'm just so glad that you took us on that journey because that's exactly right. And and I spoke with another gal in a podcast years ago, Alicia Perjado, about the nervous system. What we can also see is that a lot of these poses, even still today, the more parasympathetic poses, forward bending and longer hold poses, do activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is so great, right? Rest, digest, the social nervous system, that's wonderful. But if you continue holding these poses or you do them too much, the parasympathetic eventually leads into a nervous system state called freeze, which then can eventually lead into a nervous system state called rigor mortis. And so if we go back to what you were saying, Brett, in the beginning, it would make, therefore, perfect sense that if you did have a philosophical understanding that the body was the bad demon to get rid of, which we have to be honest, for hundreds of years, that or thousands of thousands, years, yeah, thousands of years, this was a primary focus of both Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, we can find it everywhere. This is the great divine mother schism, right? Where we take the feminine out, which is the physicality and the energy. And so to get one's body into rigor mortis was the goal. And if you superficially induce freeze and rigor mortis on a body, you can do it. In a way, you're playing God, right? You're saying, I want to die before I die. There's almost a suicidality in that. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I respect everyone's journey, but I love giving the listeners of these podcasts this information to mm -hmm. know that there is a nervous system effect on the body when we do these, these poses and to really walk with caution and understand what these poses do to the nervous system. You know, I mean, this is so exciting, right? Because when you oscillate between nervous system state of parasympathetic and sympathetic, aka sun salutes, it has a harmonizing effect on the body, right? And so you can see why Krishnamacharya was in some ways leading young people towards things that were a little bit more life affirming. But then once you get into the Iyengar, right? Long hold, you can see how these things will take the body into deeper state of what I personally wouldn't want for myself over time. And I think there's a lot of fear in the yoga world about speaking about these things because we have this false idea that everything related to this hallowed word yoga is, is somehow ancient or holy or sacrosanct. Mm -hmm. And I think I love that you kind of give such a challenge to that. Yeah. I mean, the research I've done shows that yoga has always been evolving. And that's why it needs to evolve now. Because now, like we talked about the industrial revolution, right? Now we're in the information age. So there's another huge, Rare. you know, like change that's happening, which is why we need, I think, what I call yoga habits in the book. So the book has these lists and lists. In addition to the 20 minute practice, I give you all these ideas of little ways you can integrate yoga and breath work throughout the day. Because now, I mean, we're glued to these screens. We're exposed to more information in our life than our great, great grandfathers were in their entire life. Like we experience more in a day than they ever did in their lifetimes. I mean, it's That's mind boggling, right? True. That's crazy. And I love that you said, you know, that these these ancient practices, they were kind of trying to like experience death before death, before death, right? Which the impetus of why I wrote the book was because I couldn't 
practice like that anymore. I was like, I need a practice that's actually going to nourish me and fill me up because I was living this incredibly intense year. And this is how the book opens of I had become a new mom and I was walking my father through a death portal in the same 12 month period. So I had my baby in my house in one bedroom and I had my dad on hospice care. I was his sole care provider during his cancer battle in the other room. They were like my two. And so I had birth and death. And so I was really in that by no choice of my own, really like that feminine role of like caretaker. Right. And I was like, I don't need practices that are going to like help me experience death before death right now, (laughs) nor do I have the time. I need something that is potently nourishing and that's going to help balance my energy very quickly because I'm caring for a lot of other people right now, not to mention all my employees and my business. So it's like necessity is the mother of invention. And so it was that like rock bottom year where I had to question everything I had ever known about the practice because everything that I had used up to this point, like the strict Kriyas, the Ashtanga, you know, different sequence, like I couldn't do any of it anymore. It was ripped away from me. And so I was like, okay, well, what do I do now? And the answer was that I tuned deeply inward. And the way I used to practice during this time, Katie, is I would like set a timer on my phone for how long I could practice. Sometimes it was 10 minutes. Sometimes it was 20. Some days it was five. And I would just radically like tune inward and be like, what do I need to nourish myself? You know, I was already a strong practitioner at this point. And I was questioning, I was like, is this allowed? Like, can I just do some Kundalini (laughs) breath work and then a yin pose? I was like, is someone going to arrest me? But I was like, I don't care. I have so little time. I'm just going to do it. And so I just started creating my own personal practice. And I remember this day is so vivid in my mind that I did this And I came to a place where I was, you know, moving intuitively, blending different styles, you know, afraid the Kundalini police would break down the door. Like I was just doing me and I felt so good. You know, that yoga glow you feel at the end. I was like, wow, I feel so much better. And then I thought to myself, the timer hasn't gone off yet. Oh my God. My phone must have died. Like something's wrong. You know, so I ran. And my phone still had like three minutes left on the timer. I think I had set the timer for 20 And I was able to get myself into a state in 16 minutes that felt so nourishing, that felt so like me reclaiming my authentic energy and replenished me. And I remember thinking, that's crazy. Like, how how do I feel as good in 16 minutes doing just kind of my thing than I do after a 90 minute generic group class? And that's when I knew I was like, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to create a framework around this and I'm going to teach it one day. And of course, I couldn't do it then because I was in the midst of this chaos, right? That's why I put chaos in the book's name as well. I couldn't do it then, but I was like, I'm going to reverse engineer how I did this because if other people, women, had just, I mean, I would love everyone to do 200 hour teacher training with me. I really would. But like the reality is you just need to know a couple simple tools, many of which they're already getting with you, Katie, right? Like the Ayurvedic wisdom. And then there's just a couple other key components that you need to know in order to be that apothecary and that bartender who can like whip up breath work and poses that are nourishing for you, no matter how long you have to practice. Less can be more when you're practicing what I call your soulmate postures or breathing techniques, you know, the ones that really serve to balance your energy. Uh, So it's not like it has to be long for it to be effective. And if we can change our mindset around this, the possibilities it opens up is incredible because a lot of times the more we advance in our spiritual practice, a little bit like the crazier we get, right? Like I have to be wearing white. It has to be 5 a.m. I have to do this chant. I have to have, you know, my scarf. Like it becomes this crazy thing. And I, I give a lot of anecdotes in the book where like, if you can let all that go, you know, some of my most powerful spiritual moments have been like a 10 minute practice wearing my pajamas, <laughs> right? Like it doesn't have to be glamorous. It doesn't have to be perfect. It can be in the chaos. And if you know what to do for your unique energy, it can be so profound. Mm. Well, I mean, as you're talking, I'm thinking you've made the perfect definition of pranatana. Like this word needs to be known by yogis. Pranatana was the word we used before asana or any of these things. We didn't call it that the goddess called it pranatana the energy is teaching you Mm. rather than us laying out the mat and using the prefrontal cortex to top down approach our body 
we're letting the body that is the feminine teach us. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't know if this is a secret, but Brett, I don't do a lot of yoga. Mm -hmm. And yet I do yoga. For me, I love lifting weights. I love jogging with my dog. I love dancing. And then I do this crazy, fun energy work and meditation. And a run can get me there. I mean, let's be honest, a 60 minute yoga class can get you there so great. Like that, I love like a group class for the community and the energy. But once you've tasted energy, you realize that that is what we're attempting to have a sacred relationship with. Mm -hmm. And I do think that there is value in the physicality of this thing that you and I have fallen so madly in love with. But similarly to your father, death, child, birth story, I was on the cover of Yoga Journal in Russia when I realized that I had been doing too much death work, ash work, like these teachings were called ash work because they burned you into ash. <laughs> and I'm like, I need rasa work, right? Sap, juice. I mean, you're a mom and I'm a young gal trying to start her life on her mm -hmm. own. And, and I just think there's a lot of love and relief that I know so many women are going to get from hearing this podcast with you and myself, just being honest about that. And in a way, I'm having a return to loving yoga. Like I've been going to a yoga studio here and it's been so fun to like get back into it. But I remember one of our teachers, Indu Aurora, I, I told her where I was with my yoga journey like five years ago. And she was like, you've been feasting on mantras and kriyas and asanas. I think you need to fast. And I, I see like, this in our, I see this in my students too. And in our Kundalini training, I see it, you know, they want more Kriyas, right? It's like a, it's like my kid with Pokemon, right? It's like, gotta collect them all, right? <laughs> gotta get them all, you know, more Kriyas, more. And it's just so incredible because I do think there's a beauty in the curiosity and the propulsion of that. At the same time, you know, there's a reason there's a chapter less is more. Like I practice my soulmate postures and breathing technique. Pretty much that's all I do. It's pretty boring. It's the same things every morning or not sometimes in the morning, like here and there throughout the day. I have the same positions in space that I've figured out really work for my nervous system. And so I just go straight there. And these are simple things. These aren't advanced postures. When we reframe, it's like, what's the point? And I think there's one thing I've been wanting to say here. Like when we think of the energy of the sun, the sun is constant, right? And it's more associated with the masculine. When we think of the moon more associated with the feminine, it's waxing and waning. It's changing every single day on a 30 day cycle. So when you think of yoga that maybe makes sense for a more masculine energy, right? The things like the 40 day Kriya and some of these Ashtanga, you know, like that resonates, that makes sense. But when you look at it from the lens of the moon, or the feminine aspect of everything always changing. And of course, both of these energies live within us. There's moments where you might need more structure and a Kriya is going to really support you doing a, a practice like that. But for many of us, it's like, I think what we're craving is like a practice that looks a little bit different every single day. So, I mean, if you take one thing away from this conversation, just start your practice with these two questions, which is how I start every, I actually don't, I start it the night before. The questions are, how do I feel? What do I want? How do I feel? What do I want? Ideally with your hands on your body and eyes closed or some sort of something that helps you introspect, whatever that is for you. So before I go to bed, I'm already asking, how do I feel? What do I want? Like, what is going to serve me tomorrow? Similar to you. Yesterday for me, it was going to my gym and swimming. I was like, I need, I really, you know, my body's just craving to move in that like long breaststroke way. I want to get in the water. Sometimes it's like, I'm going to do an embodiment practice. I'm going to do some yoga. And then like, I need a solid, you know, 30, 40 minutes of just like embodiment work. Sometimes it's like, you know, I feel really good. I think I'm just going to do my personal practice. And, you know, I know I have some meetings. So like, that's, that's all there's going to be time for. So there's this introspection that happens. And then a great thing you can layer onto this, because everyone listening is probably familiar is like, do I need more earth, air or fire? right? Not as your constitution, but just like thinking of the elements, right? Like 
you know, our society, newsflash, is air and fire obsessed. So a lot of times you need more earth, right? Not always, but, you know, having the introspection be the kickoff to what happens next changes everything. We do one meditation all year long, and it's the downward flow of the mm. water of the waterfall. So it's earth and water. And I find for me and for the hundreds of ladies, it doesn't matter their constitution. Because of your point, we are in the new industrial age of information. And so to have that earth and water is just so healing for us. Brett, I know we're right at time and I just, I feel like I want to have you back and go deeper into some of these just big questions. But I think this has been one of the most interesting conversations I've had on the podcast. I, I love your brain. I love that you are like so passionate about truth. And I am really encouraging everyone to go buy this book, Yoga Life. I am digging into it. And Brett, oh my God, you're making me want to unroll my dusty old yoga mat. So thank you so much. And tell everyone, I mean, they can find this book, I'm sure everywhere books are sold, but what do you have going on and where can people find you? Yes. Well, the main thing I do is certify yoga teachers and we would love to have anyone in Katie's community. Many have walked that path before and we send all of our Ayurvedic curious uh, folks to Shakti school. So I have 200 hour teacher training, 300 hour teacher training. Everything is online. So it's hundred percent online, but very interactive zoom calls, practicing together. I have a Kundalini specific 200 hour online training. I have a yoga membership site, which is a really affordable way to just kind of taste test a lot of different yogic practices and everything's taught through courses. So it's like, we're going to look at the eight limbs and then do a yoga practice that embodies each concept, like not just the yamas and the niyamas, but all sorts of different things. Uh, so there's a very kind of like scholarly aspect to the way we're practicing. So that's the uplifted yoga membership. And I'd love to hang out with you on YouTube or social media. You can find me brettlarkin.com and the book yoga life is available everywhere. Books are sold. Yes, guys, get this book. It's wonderful. Thank you so much, Brett, for being on spirit sessions. Mm, love you, Katie. Thank you. I'll be back girl. See ya. A big special thanks to Kevin Carlisle of Goodbye Gemini, who wrote this beautiful podcast music, and to DJ Juan Pablo Jimenez in southern Spain for mixing it and making it magic. <laughs>